Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan Williams, and today I'm going to talk to you about Romans 9, 1 through 5. And I'm going to do this in engagement with John Piper's book, The Justification of God. Next year will mark 50 years in which I have been engaged in the Calvinist Arminian debate. I have had many discussions with many people through the years, and I have read many outstanding books. One book that stands head and shoulders above the others from the Calvinist perspective is John Piper's book called The Justification of God, an exegetical and theological study of Romans 9, 1 through 23. Now, Piper knows the accusations against the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9. You've missed the context. John, you are using dogmatics. You're using your dogmatic theology to interpret this passage. And Piper believes that he and other Calvinists have not been given a fair shake. They have been stereotyped by these kinds of arguments. And so his goal is to deal with Romans 9, 1 through 23 without losing sight of its larger textual and historical context and without forcing it to answer dogmatic questions for which it was never intended. His work is admirable, it is stimulating, it is ironic. It's also wrong, I believe, in four ways. While his exegesis is sound, he unnaturally does fall into the trap of wedging his Calvinistic dogma into Paul's opening statement in verses 1 through 5. My presentation is in two parts. First, I will exegete Romans 9, 1 through 5, and then I will give four reasons why Piper's Calvinism does not fit Paul's words. The exegesis consists of four parts. I will talk about the structure of Romans 9, 1 through 5. Second, its place within the letter. Third, Paul's ministry experience as background to understanding the verses. And then fourth, we will have a verse-by-verse -verse analysis. Piper sets out the issue very well with these helpful comments. He says, The justification of God in 9, 14 through 23 can be properly understood only in light of the assertions of 9, 6b through 13, which have seemed to call God's righteousness into question. 9, 6b through 13 is Paul's effort to show that the word of God has not fallen, 9, 6a. And this effort can be understood only when we see why and in what sense the Word of God has been called into question. And this is what Romans 9, 1 through 5 tells us. So let's look now at the structure of Romans 9, 1 through 5. Allow me to read the passage to you. Paul said, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Paul sees two parts in this opening paragraph. He divides it with uh, verses 1 through 3, speaking of Paul's pain, and verses 4 through 5, speaking of the privileges of his kinsmen. Other people will divide it between verses 1 and 2 and 3 through 5. That's not really all that important. Uh, looking at the Greek text, we do see, however, that there are three relative clauses introduced by the words own. In verse 4, we see it, own he huiothesia. In verse 5, own ha pateris. And then again in verse 5, ex own ha Christos. The antecedent of each of these goes back to Israelites in at, at the uh, at the beginning of verse four Israelitai. <clears throat> but what is more important 
uh, is that in the first relative clause are six feminine nouns that describe Israel's privileges. The list is constructed with great care, and as you can see, it is visibly and audibly patterned. Words one and four rhyme, huiathesia and nomothesia. Words two and five rhyme, doxa and latreia. And words three and six rhyme, diathekai and epangelii. Luke Timothy Johnson said this, Paul's list has celebrated God's extravagant generosity toward a tiny portion of the world's population. It has also shown why this people, given the oracles of God, plays a distinctive role in history. Their combination of institutions and symbols was indeed unique in the ancient world. Now, Piper talks about how the meaning of these six words may lie more in the total unified impact of the sixfold blessing, but he says there's still much to learn, and I agree that there's still much to learn from each of these six blessings, and we will look at that in a few moments. Let's look now, though, right now, at the place of Romans 9, 1 through 5 within the letter. Emil Bruner may have said it best. The shout of joy with which the first main part of the letter came to an end is followed by this deeply moving complaint at the beginning of the second. Paul's exposition of justification climaxes with praise at the end of chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But that leads to a problem. Expositors would love to move from this exaltation of chapter 8 to the exhortation of chapter 12. It just seems to blend and to fit together so well. But Paul doesn't do that. Paul instead interjects this three-chapter treatise on the nation of Israel. The change is not subject matter only. It is one of emotion from highest praise to deepest sorrow. There are no conjunctions that join 839 with 91. The first word in chapter 9 is truth, aletheon. And so because of these jarring differences, some believe that 9 through 11 was written previously by Paul or even by someone else and then inserted into the letter. Piper references Dodd as the main voice of this perspective and who lists others who follow in his steps. He quotes Van Manen who argued that Romans 9 through 11 betrays tokens of an originally different source from chapters 1 through 8, and he believes that neither was written by Paul. Well, I, that's pretty much of an extreme there. Leon Morris notes that Dunn refers to it as a sermon that uh, Paul often preached, and I don't find that unusual at all, that Paul probably spoke about this on many occasions and, and preached on it on many occasions before he actually wrote it down in, in the book of Romans. That's no problem at all. <clears throat> Scholars today, though, do believe that Romans 9 to, through 11 was not forced into the book of Romans and that it was written by the Apostle Paul. Christopher Bryan said this about these words. Paul touches on the single outstanding issue that threatens to bring down everything he has so far constructed. If the gospel is God's power to save, how is it that many in Israel are not being converted to Christ? Is God, after all, unreliable? Since God has apparently failed the Jews, is God unfaithful to the promise? If so, how can we trust God? Perhaps God will be unfaithful to the church too. It's as if an elephant has been standing in the room. People have wanted to talk about it. And Paul has begged for patience while he constructed his doctrine of justification. He referred to the Jewish people in chapter 2, and he spoke of their advantages in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> but those initial thrusts had to be held at bay while he considered other themes. At last, now it was time to open the gate and let the elephant walk about. What about Israel? 
This question brings up an important point. Paul's salvation is more than individual salvation that he's been talking about. Peter Schumacher said this, Paul is by no means merely concerned with the justification of the individual sinner by faith alone for the sake of Christ. Rather, Paul also has in view the eschatological work of salvation of the one God who created the world and chose Israel to be the people of his own possession. This salvific work aims at the redemption of Israel, the Gentiles, and the entire non-human creation from sin and the dominion of death. Introducing the plight of unbelieving Israel makes perfect sense. Nothing less than God's faithfulness to all of creation is at stake. Brendan Byrne said, God bound himself in fidelity to Israel and entrusted promises of salvation to the fathers, Abraham and the other patriarchs. Yet save for a tiny remnant that has accepted Christ, those promises have not gone through, or at least appear to have been nullified by Israel's unbelief. What confidence then can Christians have in the promise and fidelity of God if his original promise has foundered? Let's talk now about Paul's ministry experience that led to Romans 9. Paul was not musing in a library. His words in 9, 1 through 5 were rooted in ministry. For these things he was often in chains. Paul was in a struggle. This was no collegiate debate. Five times he received from his fellow Jews 39 lashes, he said in one place, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The author Ernest Best said, Since Paul has concentrated so much of his preaching on the Gentiles, it might have been thought that he was a traitor to his own people, or that he did not care what happened to them. And that would be an easy conclusion to come to, where Jewish land was occupied by Roman might and punctured with Hellenistic culture. Jewish sensitivity to traitors was acute. Paul must let others know that he has not written off his kinsmen. God has not rejected them. He was living proof of that. Paul was also pressured internally by the church in Rome. And so Stuhlmacher talks about this, and he talks about all of these other issues, and he provides the most comprehensive view of Paul's ministry background in these seven points. Paul was viewed as a traitor by large parts of Judaism. He was not sure how Jerusalem would accept his offering from the Gentiles. Jewish Christians had trouble accepting his view of gospel and law. Peter's inconsistency hindered his message. We read about that in Galatians 2, verses 11 through 21. With Peter's involvement later in the Gentile missions, Paul would have to compare himself to him. Paul's preaching led to greater rejection of the gospel from Israel. And Paul was accused of giving up Jewish privileges and denying Israel's election. Piper describes Roman 9, Romans 9 as a passage that is theologically explosive, and he's talking about his views of the sovereignty of God and of unconditional election. But that's not what the explosion of Romans 9 is about. The explosion was about the dynamics inside and outside the church, the misunderstanding of his message, the violent rejection by nationalistic Jews. It was a lethal mix and it made it necessary for Paul to explain his perspective on Gentile and Jewish salvation. Douglas Moo said this, A decade of struggle to preserve the integrity and freedom of the gospel from a fatal mixture with the Jewish Torah lies behind him. A critical encounter with Jews and Jewish Christians suspicious of him because of his outspoken stance in this very struggle lies immediately ahead. And the Roman Christians themselves are caught up in this issue, divided over the degree to which 
As Christians, they are to return the Jewish heritage of their faith. Paul was faced with enormous scrutiny and pressure. Nothing less than the understanding and assurance of salvation was at stake. You see, again, if Paul, if God cannot bring his elect people to salvation, will God be able to do it for anyone? And so Paul moves from justification to the question of Israel to address the issue of God's faithfulness. He introduces his profound explanation in 9.6 through 11.36 with these two sentences of verses 1 through 5. It's true, there are no connecting words between these words in the final words of chapter 8. It's true that he goes from the heights of praise to the depths of sorrow within seconds. And it's true that 9, 1 through 5 is different in some ways from the verses that follow. Yet these verses are the hinge upon which the elephant releasing gate opens. And so we now turn to a closer look at Paul's mind and heart. And in so doing, we will finally prepare ourselves to engage with Piper's Calvinistic approach. Has he read Paul correctly? Let's look now at a verse-by-verse -verse analysis of Romans 9, 1 through 5. Paul said, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness with me in the Spirit. In characteristic fashion, Paul heaps up phrases to drive home one point. He's not antagonistic toward his fellow Jews, nor is he indifferent. What he is about to say has always burned within him since he discovered that Jesus really was the Messiah of Israel. He's not just telling the truth, but he's telling the truth in Christ. It's not just that his conscience is active. His conscience is acting in concert with the Holy Spirit. And so what truth is Paul telling? What lie is he fighting? What is it that his conscience is guarding? Paul is at once defending himself against charges of apathy towards his people, and he is beginning to chart the far-reaching consequences of what he is about to say. C. E. B. Cranfield states it this way, The very integrity and authenticity of his apostleship to the Gentiles would be called in question, were he able to give up his fellow Israelites? Were he not to suffer grief so long as they continued in unbelief? And that he regarded it as of vital importance that the Christians to whom he was writing, both Jewish and Gentile, should know of this grief of his, because for them too such a grief was the only attitude with regard to the Jews' continued unbelief that would be consistent with faith. Thus, in a few words, Paul refutes the charges of apathy and failing to see far-ranging consequences. He defends his apostolic authority and exemplifies the attitude Roman Gentile Christians should exhibit toward unbelieving Jews. Two phrases describe Paul's pain, great sorrow and unceasing grief. The nouns are lupe and audune, and they are found together in the Septuagint in Isaiah 35.10 and 51.11, where they are translated sorrow and sighing. But sorrow and sighing disappear. They flee away in the light of the kingdom. But they don't flee away. They don't disappear for Paul. Christ inaugurated the kingdom with signs and wonders, and suffered. Paul experiences the same. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. He healed the sick. He cast out spirits. He exulted in the promises of the kingdom and suffered as he brought the kingdom to his kinsmen and to the nations. Together, the words experience, the, the words express personal loss and devastation. Personal loss. It's his own kinsmen's loss, and yet he too feels the loss, and it is unceasing. 
like Jesus who wept over Jerusalem and like the prophets of old who agonized over their rebellious people, Paul weeps over his people. Paul has a wish. Paul has a prayer. If it were possible, he would take upon himself the curse that his kinsmen have called down upon themselves. The word is anathema, a votive offering in a temple to a god or goddess for consecration or for cursing. Though it refers to both in ancient usage, Arndt and Ginrich note that the New Testament emphasis moves decidedly in the direction of the latter. Anathema translates the Hebrew cherem, which refers to things devoted to destruction. Baim refers to the word arur, which would be used by rabbis to speak of those under the synagogue ban. And then Paul uses the imperfect tense uxamen, which matches the imperfect tense often denoting past continuing action, and it matches his unceasing grief. Commentators believe that Paul is giving the sense of an unreal condition, and that a fitting English expression is, would to God that I could become a curse. Cranfield says, Paul would pray in the way indicated were it permissible for him to do so. And if the fulfillment of such a prayer could benefit his fellow Jews, but he does not do so because he realizes it would be wrong and fruitless. Sometimes it is translated as the word wish. It's translated that way in Galatians 4.20. Cranfield uh, prefers to use the word pray as do many other commentators in Romans 9. And he does so because he believes that Paul had in mind Moses' prayer for his people in Exodus chapter 32. Some have also noted the martyrdom of the Maccabees uh, during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, and especially the martyrdom of the seven sons of Salomonia and her husband. We find these words in 4th Maccabees, that has the idea of suffering in behalf of other people. 4th Maccabees 6, 28 and 29 says, Be merciful to your people, and let our punishment suffice for them. Make my blood their purification, and take my life in exchange for theirs. And then in chapter 17, in verse 21, we find these words. The tyrant, and that would refer to Antiochus Epiphanes IV. The tyrant was punished and the homeland purified, they, that is the martyrs, having become, as it were, a ransom for the sin of our nation, and through the blood of those devout ones and their death, as an atoning sacrifice, divine providence preserved Israel that previously had been mistreated. These examples were possibly in the mind of Paul when he wrote these words. But if they were, they would definitely be subsumed in light of the Messiah's sacrifice for his people. Paul was following in the footsteps of Jesus. The second century apologist and theologian Origen captured Paul's heart when he said, Why be surprised that the apostle desires to be cursed for his brethren's sake, when he who is in the form of God emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and was made a curse for us. Why be surprised if, when Christ became a curse for his servants, one of his servants should become a curse for his brethren? In 43 words only in the Greek text, Paul expressed deep love for his people and believed that God still had a plan for them. This is brought up very sharply in the Greek text. Paul used the first person singular, which would have been sufficient to say that he prayed or he wished that he would become a curse for his people. But he goes beyond this. He doesn't just use a first person singular, but he adds the words, altos ego. I myself, I was assumed, but he says, I would become a curse. I myself would become a curse if possible. And he does this for emphasis to show how deeply he feels about this.
Paul now lists the six blessings of the Israelites. In the post-biblical period, Byrne tells us that the word Israel or Israelite or Israeli was the preferred self-designation for the Jewish people. The word Jew or Jews was used by outsiders. Israelite, therefore, was an honorific that God gave to the people. He gave it first to Jacob, and while Paul uses the word Jew early in his letter, he uses it only twice in Romans 9-11, through and he uses the word Israelite prominently in chapters 9-11. through He does so because Paul is speaking of his people's noble spiritual heritage that is encapsulated in these six blessings. Blessing number one is this, the adoption as sons. And this refers to the nation as God's son in the world. Piper believes that this corporate sonship was a status that was conferred upon the people and that it also applies to a glorious future for Israel beyond the old theocratic blessings. But as we know from Paul's exposition in the first eight chapters, it now belongs to all in Christ, Gentile as well as Jew. And this is part of the problem of Israel and why Paul is feeling such intensity. Then he speaks of the glory. This is the glory that was exhibited on Mount Sinai, in the tabernacle, in the temple, to Elijah, to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, to others. But Paul is speaking of more than past appearances of the glory of God. Like sonship, this too had an eschatological hope to it. And like the like Paul's words re, uh, regarding the adoption, uh, it refers to uh, all believers, Gentile as well as Jew, that this is something that all of us get to experience and look forward to, the glory of God. Then we have the covenants, and the covenants refers to Abraham, to uh, the covenant that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then to the nation of Israel at Sinai. Some believe it also refers to the covenant with Israel at, on the plains of Moab, the covenant at Ebal and Gerizim when they were in the land, and the covenant that he made to David. Leon Morris adds the covenant to Noah and to Joshua. But regardless of how wide we cast this net or how narrow we cast uh, the covenants that Paul had in mind here, Israel's covenant relationship with God was unique. John Walton notes that the gods in the ancient world did not have a covenant relationship with nations. Paul does not use the word covenant in chapters 1 through 8, but the idea nevertheless is present throughout because he speaks of God being faithful to his promises. Then we have the giving of the law. This refers to the giving at Mount Sinai, but it also refers to the content of the law. And most commentators emphasize that um, it, Paul has in mind here the latter, the, the, the content of the law, and that Israel had a privileged status because it had the oracles of God. But as Paul talked about early on in his letter to the church at Rome, all believers now substantiate the law whether Jew or Gentile, and we substantiate the law by faith. And then we have the temple service. The temple service refers, of course, to the practices in the temple to maintain the worship of God. Cranfield expands this to the synagogue and to pious Jewish homes. Paul will use the same Greek word here, latreia, to exhort believers to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice in chapter 12 and verse 1. And finally, we come to the last privilege of Israel, the promises. The promises are contained in the covenants. Covenants emphasizes God's faithfulness. Piper says that the promises emphasize all the good that God can possibly afford his people. Richard Longnecker says, These are the religious high points of the story of the nation of Israel. And if his viewpoint is correct, and I think that is a really good summary of it, that these are the religious high points, it is no wonder then that Paul ends this introduction with a benediction of praise. Whose are the fathers? And from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all? 
God blessed forever. Amen. How does Piper resolve the conflict if we have taken these promises and applied them to Gentile people as well as Jewish people. Piper framed it well when he said this, Paul's intention is missed if these privileges are described as mere antiquarian, theocratic distinctives, or as simply passing over from Israel to the church. Rather, the privileges are in some sense still the prerogative of historical Israel. And that's the problem. That's the conflict. How can they still belong? They, they still belong to the Jewish people. But how can they still belong to them if they are unbelieving? How does Piper resolve this conflict? Well, he resolves it with Calvinistic dogma in spite of his stated goal to avoid this. And so I will now engage with his comments and show how his comments do not fit with the spirit or the letter of what Paul has said. And so we look now at four reasons why Piper's Calvinism does not fit Paul's words. First is what I call the narrative problem. Piper goes to great lengths in his opening pages to substantiate the unity of Romans 9 through 11 and its place within the rest of the book. He is to be commended for this. He engages with Dinkler, who sees Paul as contradicting himself. Dinkler says that Romans 11 speaks about God responding to conditions, but Romans 9 speaks of God's free choices. Romans 11 refers to historical Israel, and chapter 9 refers to the church. Piper, as I said, is to be commended for his defense of Paul, but he goes about it in the wrong way. Piper argues for the freedom of God. He said, God has employed 4,000 years of redemptive history, of redemptive history to teach that he is free and not bound to save anyone because of his Jewishness, nor to condemn anyone because of his non-Jewishness. Can he not at the end of the age, having demonstrated his freedom beyond the shadow of a doubt, bring his free and sovereign election of Israel to a climax by banishing ungodliness from Jacob and saving the whole people? Thus, Romans 9 through 11, according to Piper, and the 4,000 years of redemptive history is about the freedom of God in unconditional election. But when we look at the patriarchal narratives, is that what we see? God's freedom to elect some and not others to salvation? Or do we see a narrative of God choosing a man and his descendants to bless everyone else? The answer is obvious. In Genesis 12, 3, God said to Abraham, In you I will bless all the families of the earth. God's work in Abraham is for everyone. Was the narrative with which Paul was familiar a, a philosophical abstract treatise of God's freedom? Or was it a story of God working through one nation to bring salvation to all the nations? A better way to refute Dinkler would have been if Piper had showed that Dinkler's Calvinism was foreign to the text of Romans 9 to 11, and that like Genesis, it was not about God's freedom to elect unconditionally. Thus, there is no contradiction between 11 and 9. The issue that gave rise to chapter 9 and verses 1 through 5 was Israel's unbelief. Piper agreed, but in his solution, dogmatism gets in the way of the narrative. Piper says that God's fulfillment of this intention is just as free from human constraints as the initial election of Abraham. 
Piper imports Calvin's dogma, which is missing from the Genesis narrative. Let's look now at what I call the definition problem. Piper believes Romans 9 through 11 promotes unconditional election. Now, this is not surprising. Piper is a Calvinist. We would expect that. But is unconditional election in Paul's mind? Piper says this, Paul's bold assertion is that the glorious privileges of Israel belong to unbelieving Israel. That's fine. That was the problem. The elect did not believe. Election, therefore, cannot mean election to salvation. It must mean election to status, privilege, and purpose because these elect ones that he's talking about in verses 1 through 5 were lost. If election in verses 1 through 5 is not about salvation, but is about privilege, which he lists in a sixfold manner, where and when did it become about salvation or damnation in verses 6 and following? Piper says, we should allow the privileges of 9, 4, and 5 to apply to Paul's now unbelieving kinsmen according to the flesh. Not, of course, to every individual Jew, but, as 9.6b says, to the elect among them. Election, then, for Piper, means one thing in 9.1-5, through 5, but something else in 9.6 and following. But on what basis can he change the definition? Then we come to what I call the prophecy problem. Paul has a solution to Israel's unbelief. Those whose heritage is the sixfold blessing, but who have been cut off, cut out from the olive tree, can come back in if they do not continue in their unbelief. Paul says in 11.23, And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, now let's stop here just for a moment. He must be. He has to be talking about the same people in 9, 1 through 5. The same ones he talked about all throughout chapter 9 that Piper says are not the elect unto salvation. But Paul says that if these people do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So it's a very simple solution. Paul grieves over these people because they do not now believe, even though they are the elect people of God who have these amazing privileges for the sake of the whole world. And Paul, in grieving for them, prays for them, and he says they can come back into the family of God. They can come back into the olive tree. God is able to graft them back in if they will start believing in the Messiah. But that's not the perspective that John Piper has. He says, in view of Paul's argument in chapter 11 that all Israel will someday be saved, we should al allow the privileges of 9, 4, and 5 to apply to Paul's now unbelieving kinsmen according to the flesh. Not, of course, to every individual Jew, but as 9, 6b says, to the elect among them, and as 11.25 suggests, to that part of the historical people in existence at the end of the age. Piper must push this salvation to the end of the age. It cannot refer to current unbelievers because they are not elect with the new definition of election that he pulls out of thin air. But what kind of comfort is this for the time in which Paul was living? That a future generation sometime down the road was going to be saved? Paul's hope that he mentions in Chapter 11, verses 30 through 32, is that God would show mercy upon the current unbelieving part of Israel in his time. But to do what Piper says causes those verses to lose their force. Then we come to the emotional problem. And this is my favorite. Piper's interpretation fails to account for Paul's emotion. His exegesis of the individual parts of 1 through 5 is very good, but he never addresses this question. If Paul's purpose is to speak of God's freedom in electing whom he will, 
and a God who is unconstrained by human activity, why would he begin with such pathos in 9, 1 through 5? We must remember Paul's words. He had great sorrow. He had unceasing grief. Although he was branded a traitor, he would, if possible, bear the curse on behalf of these unbelieving people. He said, I'm telling the truth. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness. Paul spoke in Christ. His conscience, conscience bore witness with God's spirit. These realities do not mesh with a man who then coolly and calmly proceeds to expound on double predestination. We are not dealing with a young Augustine whose free will theology gave way to a mature Augustine who held to hard predestination as he grappled with Pelagius. We're not dealing even with a theological evolution as if 9, 1 through 5 were Paul's earlier Arminian stage and 9, 6 and following were his more mature Calvinistic reflection. The heights of praise at the end of chapter 8 gave way to the depth of sorrow in 9, 1 through 5, only to give rise to a new chorus of thanksgiving and wonder in 11, 33 through 36, as he considered that the final word had not been written for his current kinsmen. Emotion is rife throughout the passage, and Piper has failed to do justice to Paul's heart in 9, 1 through 5. I conclude, therefore, that Piper missed the point. He missed it emotionally and prophetically. He obfuscated the meaning of election and ignored the Genesis narrative. Piper's opening chapters failed. He exegeted the words and phrases well. He ably examined the trees, but misnamed the forest because he let his dogma dictate his doctrine instead of letting Paul and the narrative of Scripture shape his thinking.